Welcome. Uh, so you are the CEO and founder of an incredibly fascinating company uh, right here in New York called Control Labs. Um, and uh, uh, you guys are the intersection of like neuroscience, machine learning, software, hardware, lots of different things, and uh, building a neural interface, an API for the brain. Do you want to? Yeah, we call it <coughs> neural interface technology uh, rather than brain machine interface because we uh, <clears throat> I'm trying to work around a presumption that most people have that the brain means this thing that's up here above your shoulders when actually the, the brain is this long, continuous organ that goes all the way down your spinal cord. Um, so uh, that's how we, we talk about the technology as a neural interface. We are here in New York. We are only very thinly a hardware company. We are overwhelmingly a neurosciences and machine learning company. Uh, we come out of uh, the part of neuroscience called computational neuroscience or uh, theoretical neuroscience, people who build computational models of how real biological neurons do their work. Uh, and we've, uh, sure, I will try. <clears throat> um, or they should turn up the speakers. Uh, uh, so we uh, create algorithms that uh, try to decode the activity of individual motor neurons and turn that uh, into control over machines that completely change the rules that define the interface between you and the machine. Great, and uh, we're going to show a couple of videos to see how that, how that manifests. Uh, and it's completely mind-blowing stuff, and you know, it, would, it would feel like science fiction if you guys, and you in particular, didn't have such a, an incredible background. We'll, we'll talk about this in a, in a minute. Um, but uh, yeah, maybe let's, let's play the videos so that uh, people can get a sense for what, how this manifests and maybe talk through it. Okay, so this is somebody wearing our band that's decoding the activity of the neurons that drive the hand, so that happens through the forearm. And what they're able to do is get multiple degrees of freedom of control over this, what is meant to be a virtual reality experience. Uh, and what we're really trying to do is emphasize something that is kind of missing in VR today, which is rather than giving you more embodiment in VR, rather it's kind of focusing on action at a distance, that kind of control at a distance, the kind of Luke Skywalker powers that we all fantasize of having. Okay, the force. The force. This is what you, do, you guys do as a company, your, your force as a service. Yeah. So um, I, actually, I actually had a chance to, to demo this to Mark Hamill back in May, and it was sort of a, <laughs> I, I felt like I could have just retired at that point and wow. <laughs> called it a career. <laughs> <laughs> what about this one? Uh, it's actually just the same thing all over again. <laughs> I'm not actually sure why this is here, because it's a much poorer version of the other video that we just showed you. Um, but the, the, the whole point is that, um, like you see the hand moving, but for the, the whole idea is that you don't need to make movements, right? The, yeah. the device captures your intent and expresses it in a way that the machine can understand. Yeah, um, what we're trying to emphasize is this idea that, you know, we're not trying to understand what you are doing to another device, this kind of mechanical transduction. Sorry, I think we've... Got some confusion about which videos to play. So um, uh, we're really we're decoding the activity of the neurons that actually drive your movements. So rather than you move and you manipulate a device like a keyboard or a mouse, and then that ends up becoming you know some change, some some control over a computer. Instead, we decode the activity of the neurons directly. What that allows you to do is to start to do things you could never do by moving. You could never do by wiggling your fingers. Instead now, you start to imagine experiences in which it's like you have 20 fingers or you have eight arms and legs instead of the four that you have. Um, and you really get a kind of facile control because we're engaging the motor nervous system, which is in some sense, the evolved output part of the port of the brain. We're not drilling into your skull trying to understand sort of what your thoughts are. I'll tell you there's not a neuroscientist alive who can tell you what a thought is. Um, but instead, we're trying to understand your intentions. And your intentions are expressed via your motor nervous system, the output of your brain. And to take a step back, what was the uh, inspiration of this? I think I read or heard you say that uh, uh, you felt that we as a civilization or as a species have been let down by the iPhone and other mobile devices. I, I think the iPhone is a... Is a Trump-level disaster for humanity. <laughs> um, 
So, uh, yeah, it really does. It, 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 it took us in the entirely wrong direction in terms of us becoming kind of more proactive, performant, <laughs> sentient human beings and instead sort of is a device about human enslavement. Uh, you know, uh, and the Apple Watch is just further down that path. So it's, you know, my fingers didn't get smaller when the watch was created. Um, so what ended up happening is I treat it more and more like a device that's only inputting to me, but I'm not outputting to it. I don't write extensively on my phone. I get out little teeny messages. So I'm less communicative. I'm less productive. I'm less creative. And I engage less and less of my real cognitive powers. Instead, I fight the phone. I call it this curse where I'm, you know, correcting the autocorrector as like the most challenging cognitive task of typing on a phone. That's absurd. What I want to do is get rid of the 19th century keyboard entirely and allow you to effectively sort of text, if you will, at the level of your cognitive capacity. Um, and we're actually kind of far on our way down that path. So how does it work? So the core technology that we use is something called surface electromyography, which is really um, uh, reading out the electrical activity of your muscles as your muscles respond to the input from motor neurons. But because we're neuroscientists, uh, and motor neuroscientists in particular, we figured out how to actually reconstruct the activity of the motor neurons that drove that electrical activity in the muscles themselves. This is activity that actually happens long before the muscles actually move, you know, long in the computational sense of, you know, 100 to 200 milliseconds before. Uh, uh, we can deconvolve this very complicated electrical signal that is really available at your skin, and we're able to actually parse it out into the individual neurons that drove that muscle. So think of the hundreds to thousands, there's probably on the order of 20 to 30,000 neurons that drive all of this. Uh, and we can listen to each individual neuron, and then we can allow you to actually control them. So rather than just moving one of your 14 muscles, you're now able to talk to a machine via any one of 20 or 30,000 individual neurons. It's a, it's a complete game changer. It completely changes the concept of what computer inter human interaction is. It's no longer what can I express to a machine by movement. It's what can I express to a machine by thinking, and more particularly what I say is by intention. What does it mean to truly intend and make a computer, uh, a machine, a robot, do something according to my will? Um, I, I, that might still sound distract. What I would say is it's, at heart, a lot of deep networking technologies and a lot of very sophisticated signal processing that I'm sure lots of you in this crowd might be able to kind of work your way through that uh, allows us to feed spiking signals from motor neurons, these individual motor units, the zeros and ones that they admit, we call them action potentials, and actually feed those directly into DNNs. I won't go into the you know, some of our secret sauce in there, but uh, to build up models that allow you to dynamically control systems, whether that's symbolic things like a keyboard, or whether it's much more continuous things like being able to move in virtual reality with six degrees of freedom and what we'll call continuous control. Mm -hmm. and, and just in, in very, like, a layman, layman's term, like, uh, one key thing, um, that I learned reading about the, the, the company is that the output of the brain is, is muscle, right? Like the, the only thing that the brain produces is commands to control muscles. So, so you're capturing that intent and instead of moving yeah, the muscle, get, you move the machine. I get really excited by that concept and some people get depressed by it. So I'll <laughs> repeat it here and I hope you're as excited by it as I am because it'll, it'll, it'll help you feel empowered in the body you already have. Uh, the only thing your brain does is turn muscles on and off. There's nothing else that it does. You receive all this information, you process it, and then the output is muscles on and off for speech, for whatever. If you're doing mathematical exercises in your brain and you have no ability to communicate with it, nothing happened. The happening is turning muscles on and off, and you're really good at it. In fact, you're better at it than anything else. You're much better at it than you are at math. You're much better at it than you are at thinking about words before you speak them. What you're really good at is controlling your muscles in a dynamical way. Uh, you are able to move in a very skillful way. I talk about, in particular, like if you just took a glass of water and take a sip of that water, 
take a sip of that beer in front of you. Thank you. <laughs> take a sip. There it is. That is the most complicated thing you will ever do in your entire life. That, that was really impressive. <laughs> There's nothing that even comes close. The amount of your brain that was involved in that action is extraordinary. And there really aren't other animals that can do it. Not even the great apes. Not as skillfully as you just did. And what I mean by that is that bottle is different than any other bottle you ever drank or any other cup of water you ever had. It's always changing. It's this fully dynamical system. And you're doing this insane amount of computation to do it skillfully. And you do it without any sense of a cognitive load. It's the exact opposite of that iPhone experience. The exact opposite. You took a sip of beer without really even thinking about it. Yet it probably used, you know, a third or half of your brain in real time. It's extraordinarily difficult. So what happens if you actually take that ability that you have to control your musculature and target it towards controlling machines? Not with your voice, not by banging through some 19th century keyboard, not by doing the kind of monkey dance like Tom Cruise in Minority Report, but instead by marshalling that incredibly inbuilt skill you have that you mastered you know, in the first year of your life to control this really complicated system to an end goal. Uh, and I'll keep preaching this all night long if you want to stay, but uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a pretty outstanding result, and, and like, it's, there's real progress. We started shipping our developer kits last Friday after, boy, over three years of work. Uh, and uh, we've got you know, thousands and thousands of developers on a waiting list uh, that are starting to build experiences with it. Uh, that I think are showing off how real this is. So uh, precisely, let, let's jump on that. So wh what, are, what is the range of different things one can do? So you talked about VR, immersive environments. Do you want to double click on that? I mean, you know, when you're building a startup rather than doing this sort of inside of Bell Labs or something, you, you have to pick your opportunities based on where you get the most economic leverage early and what you think will extend down, down the road. Of course, our end goal is this is how you do everything. There's nothing that this isn't good for or better for than anything you're doing today. It's better than typing on that screen or swiping on it. It's better than a keyboard. It's better than a mouse. It's better than jumping up and down in front of a Kinect camera. Uh, but we got to pick our, our moments and our targets early. For us, immersive computing, uh, VR and AR, are really, really obvious because there are no good control experiences in VR today. They're all kind of proxies and compromises. Kind of at the other end of the spectrum is what we think of as pervasive computing. And this is everything from kind of IoT to the Apple Watch on your wrist, none of which have good interaction experiences. And what we really want to offer is universal control. So I have this band, and it's the same band I use to gesture and think at the Nest thermostat on the wall and change the temperature as I do to control the TV there as it is to actually play an Xbox game as it is to type a message quickly. Uh, uh, I can't just offer universal control day zero. It's something we build up to, uh, but we're pretty excited about those early opportunities and again, in pervasive and in uh, immersive computing. The last part I'd say, um, uh, only because Sarah talked just before me and I talked to her about this a long time ago, is uh, there's a lot of opportunities for this in robotics. Um, and that's been a surprise for us because we didn't start the company thinking about robotics at all. And those opportunities have all kind of inbound to us and actually led to some of our investments. Uh, you know, there's no predefined way for humans and robots to interact today. Everybody's figuring it out right now. And we have a kind of a magical solution relative to the other things that are being offered. I mean, so sort of business strategy, going the, the platform route, uh, meaning that you're agnostic to whatever an application ends up being built on top of the platform? Other than text, because text is so universal, um, we really are very, very developer focused. Um, uh, with text, we're a bit more minded about a full end user solution. Um, but the, the bulk of our strategy and kind of where all of the money is being spent is against our developer opportunities mm -hmm. uh, and really kind of energizing them to do like novel new interactions in VR, in AR, et cetera. And, you know, by the way, congratulations on shipping. That's a major, major Thanks. thing. Uh, I just want to say, if I was listening to me in this audience, I would be calling bullshit because we haven't really shown any videos that prove all this. So I hope we do. And if not, if we only get through a couple, then come and see me afterwards and we'll show you a lot more. 
And so what, what can people do if I'm a developer and I'm fascinated by what I'm hearing? Just go on the, go on the site and sign up or? Control-labs.com okay. and, and submit a... Uh, am, am I one of, you know, hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands? And M how do I, yeah, how do more, I get to... More than 10,000, less than 100,000. Okay. And how do I get selected? Uh, some of my colleagues are actually here tonight and they do interviews. So we're pretty crazy about our developer program. Uh, we interview, we do video conferences and interview every single applicant. Uh, we're, we've been, we are a little bit sparse with hardware right now, um, so we're, we're choosy who it goes to. But we have somebody write an application, I mean a, a text, not a program application, a, a, a submission of what they want to do with the device and experiences they want to build, and then we look at uh, how credible the application is. Do they have a sense of funding for it? How long they're going to be able to work on it, et cetera? And then we get them devices based on that. Mm -hmm. We, we, we uh, talked only briefly about the machine learning part of this. Uh, I meant to, to ask you, so this, so you capture the signal and then the signal goes into a machine learning system of, of some sort and what, uh, why do you need machine learning? What does machine learning uniquely do? I mean, decoding the human nervous system is the mother of all machine learning problems. I, I think it's significantly more complicated than predicting the weather, say. Like it is, 15 billion plus neurons, 100 billion that count certain parts of the brain, like that signal chaotically, I mean in the formal definition of chaos, you know, high loop, who enough concept, like it's the mother of all machine learning problems. There is no system in nature more complicated than the human brain that we could throw machine learning at. To flip it around, we are at a point now where we can actually get to the most atomic data from the nervous system meaning the zeros and ones, the action potentials of the nervous system. And that's, guess what? That's kind of how most deep networks are built today. We program them and we let them do their virtual spiking models and allow them to kind of train a network and train the weights in the network to, uh, to map out to some final behavior. Uh, we, we just haven't to date had the ability to actually get those zeros and ones out of the nervous system at scale until now. We really, th this was, uh, those of you who don't have a neuroscience background, this is a pretty significant breakthrough that we're able to get to single neurons without basically penetrating into your skull. Uh, when I say get to, I mean get that signal from single neurons. Um, and it's only because of that that we can actually sort of contemplate the modeling work that we want to do, the machine modeling work, we, machine learning modeling work that we want to do. Um, I want, I'll end there. Just before opening up to um, to questions, so you know the idea of building a product that would do everything in the world would be uh, generally considered crazy, except in your case, you worked on a product, so you actually led a product that had a billion users. Do you want to talk about this and a little bit your your background? Not really. All right, I'll, I'll do I, it I for you. I'll do it for you, and let me know if I'm a, so. Um, you started a, a company at 19. Yep. That was acquired. Yep. You left the acquirer uh, to join Microsoft. That's right. Where you led the Internet Explorer project. So I, yeah, I, I went and worked on Windows for quite a while, and then I started up Internet Explorer uh, in '94, um, and then uh, uh, worked on IE all the way through IE4 when we finally sort of won the browser war. Uh, and as part of that, pioneered HTML, XML. And I had my hands really dirty. I was I helped found the W3C with Tim Berners-Lee and, and kind of set up those initial web standards. Um, I, I, you know, I'm very proud of my work on CSS, if people know what that is. Uh, so I had my hands really dirty with uh, kind of the w core web technologies on the client side through all the 90s. Uh, and I left Microsoft after 10 years in 2000 to go pursue other things. Uh, you went back to school? I, I, because oh, I didn't go to school to when school. I was, I went to school. Uh, uh, yeah, I went to school, I studied Greek and Latin, very valuable skills. Um, uh, but then I actually started getting an itch to do neuroscience. Um, and I was able to you know, stay around Columbia and then Duke and I did a PhD uh, in neuroscience at Columbia. Uh, it also meant I didn't work and I was unemployed for almost 12 years doing all of that. Uh, it was a big investment of my life. Uh, and I, you know, did, you know, serious bench neuroscience 
for many years, uh, and it was an absolute thrill. And there's really no way we could have started this company if I hadn't found the other neuroscientists to, 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 to found it with, and if I didn't, you know, if I hadn't really steeped in it for a decade. It, it's not like, I, we're working on an incredibly hard problem. I think we've made incredible breakthroughs, but it's not something a 19-year-old could have done. Uh, this is a different kind of problem. And I'm sure you cringe every single time an interviewer mentions this, but uh, you grew up with uh, 18 siblings. I don't cringe at that. I cringe at all of the IE stuff. Um, uh, so, we, so we pass that phase. I always, I generally when I talk about IE, I always say, like, you're welcome and I apologize. Uh, <laughs> uh, I did. I'm one of 18 kids, uh, baby of 10, and then we adopted eight kids. I don't know how to describe that experience because usually when you're trying to describe a social experience to people, you do it in some kind of, you know, by way of analogy, and there is really no way of analogy. Uh, it's totally different than any of the way any of you grew up. <laughs> I don't know. It's in a 2,400 uh, square foot house, like I read somewhere. Yeah, uh, this read it somewhere. Where does this stuff come out? Uh, uh, yeah, we grew uh, up oh, in a so not a social security yeah, number. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we. Uh, <laughs> Just publish my address. I'll be fully doxxed. Right? Um, I, uh, I, I did not grow up wealthy. I grew up quite poor. Uh, there's not really a way around that. Very uh, w without means, uh, which is really why I didn't go to college. Uh, I left high school when I was 15 and just started working. It was that straightforward. Uh, I could write code. I was pretty good, so I made money early, and that kind of got me rapidly out to Microsoft. Wonderful. All right. Do we have over here? Sorry. I don't want to ask a question, I just want to handle this box. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, this has just been eating at me, and I tweeted this. I think, okay, so you have a man, the ultimate man-machine interface. So instead of keyboarding on my iPhone, I just think, and it keyboard, and it basically comes out the message for me, or I, or I fuse with every machine. And I'm thinking in the back of my mind, one thing I've not heard tonight, which I think would be killer, would be improving the life of amputees with prosthetics. And I'm surprised I haven't heard that. Um, come and see me after and I'll show you a pretty compelling video of exactly what you're asking for. Um, I'll tell you, we are both from our own work as well as work that we've done um, with uh, APL, the Applied Physics Laboratory at Johns Hopkins. I, we're doing, it's really outrageous what we're doing. It's a kind of prosthetic interaction that's never been achieved before. Uh, it just ch changes the entire potential outcome for people who've had either motor neuropathy, some sort of nervous system disorder, or some limb loss, or, or, or uh, you know, some you know, a, a genetic defect that didn't fully form a limb, et cetera. Y you should see what we're able to do. It's pretty shocking. Um, uh, what I would say is, and this I think is important, we started the company adamant that we weren't creating what I'll call an FDA-facing company, i.e. we weren't out here trying to create clinical solutions for people. We did say we wanted to be able to partner deeply with companies and, and labs that would, including places like APL. Um, we felt like if we focused on, I call it the 8 billion user market, I've been corrected, there's only 7.4 billion humans, but I have high aspirations. Uh, so that 8 billion user market, addressing technologies out there leads to the breakthrough technologies that can help clinical populations. Whereas if you, if you go just to the clinical population first, which is sort of where Neuralink is going with their work, it's just grindingly slow progress. Like we can come out of the gate and start collecting data and innovating models across hundreds of thousands of people day one. And that's the real problem as everyone in this room knows with modeling work. It's how do I get to the right data at scale? Um, and if you did that, strictly through clinical populations, it would be grindingly slow progress. We think we do way much more for clinical populations by focusing broader. Hi, over here. Um, just curious if you could speak to the revenue model with the developers, is it like a partnership? Is, is it all on your company side or what? Yeah, so, so our, our revenue model is based on us uh, charging effectively a subscription for modeling work. But in fact, what we are pushing right now is one in which it's a free license to the hardware and a free license to the initial models. And we want to get paid 
for the work that really aligns with what we're doing, i.e. that we're doing always on continuous modeling of your nervous system. I, I, we haven't gone into how this really works at a modeling level, but it's not a one-shot model. This is a very personal model that is custom to just you. When you put on the band after you've trained it, if you put it on somebody else, it doesn't work at all. It is, and it's not like design, that, that's just the way neural interfaces are required to work. There's no other option. So we get paid for the ongoing maintenance and update of models, uh, and we want developers to be just building a, a plethora of applications that leverage those models at a per user basis. There will be situations in which you know, our biggest commercial deal pays us because this gets attached to a big platform right now, or unannounced, but gets attached to a big platform, and we'll get paid as users on that platform pay to participate in that platform, if that makes some sense. Uh, but for most developers, we're just, you know, these are developer kits. There's some cost involved for some, you know, set of people, but we're not trying to make money from the developer community. We're trying to get them to build experiences. Let's do a couple more. So if you're starting to look at prosthetics, um, over here, if you're starting to look, uh, tie this with prosthetics, have you thought about applying it to nano uh, for people who have nerve damage? I don't understand the nano part. What I would say is um, I think I covered it a little bit ago, but you know, motor neuropathy, i.e. motor neuron disease, so that could be anything from, you know, broadly speaking, uh, Parkinson's or Huntington's out to uh, any number of, you know, uh, you know ALS, et cetera. Um, we are probably doing the most important work in the world right now to not so much alleviate symptoms, but bring agency back to people who otherwise would lose you know, motor function. Um, and that's because I don't need to perceive your entire movement. I just need to perceive a little bit, a hint of the neural signal that would have driven that movement. Instead, you need, like I said, 30,000 uh, neurons to drive these hand movements, but it's mostly because you need those neurons to sort of gain up the signal. But we only need like a dozen to be able to actually understand what the, uh, the actual movement intent was rather than the 30,000. So somebody potentially with ALS, uh, uh, we can you know, offer a, a, a really interesting solution for because they still have some residual motor neuron uh, activity, but insufficient to actually drive contractions of the muscles. Um, I hope that makes some sense. I can go into Parkinson's and why things like resting tremor become easier for us to go work through because it's, from an ML perspective, it's an easy signal to, to uh, filter, um, the, the tremor signal. Um, I, I hope that gets you closer to what you wanted, um, but I don't, I, what I would say is, look, we're not trying to we don't need to go into the skull to do our work, even for people with significant motor neuron problems. Right, one last one. Um, so how steep is the learning curve to, uh, to, to learn to use this technology? And do you think children, the people that are going to learn this as children, are going to be at a significant advantage versus adults? And if so, if that's gonna, what, what is that going to do to society? Children always have an advantage on adults at everything, um, at computers, at everything. Um, so uh, the training times, um, it really kind of depends. It's a very task specific. So I would say I can put a band on you and after 10 minutes, I will know enough from those signals that I can pull you out of a population of 7.4 billion people after 10 minutes of training data and do that in about 800 milliseconds. It, this is way more accurate than face ID. This is way more accurate than thumb printing and way more accurate than voice printing. It's, some of that's because we're cool and we do cool work, but this is just what your nervous system is. Like you have, your nervous system is wired stochastically and it's just utterly unique to you. Your clone has an entirely different motor neuron map than you have. Uh, what that means is there's a, there's, a, there's a map to the amount of training you do yourself and the amount of function that you're actually able to gain. Um, pretty much anything like, say, mouse and keyboarding experiences, think of that on the order of minutes of training. If you're talking about, you know, the first time ever flying your drone, you know, Air Force, uh, who knows? I don't know, hours, days, I, I can't even predict. I do know where our targets are and I do know what progress we've made. Today it takes 
uh, you know, an order an hour or so to do text training. Uh, we're trying to get that down into the order of, you know, 10 minutes. Um, and by that, I mean like full fidelity text, like you would have at your full desktop keyboard. All right, that's absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much for coming to share this story with us. Thanks.